Southeast Asia is one of the most diverse places on the planet. With so many different cultures and religions, all living side by side. And I'm an example of just that. My name is Peter Lee. I'm a Singaporean scholar of Peranakan descent, Chinese with a dash of Malay blood. I celebrate being mixed up. It's right in my DNA. My passion is collecting artifacts that offer a fresh narrative. It's a European fairy tale but is depicted on a batik from Indonesia. How wonderful is that? I'm setting off on a new journey, traveling further back in time. Oh my God, we see this everywhere in Southeast Asia. To explore how the region's mighty empires have shaped our collective identity. This is a gold mine. No culture exists in isolation. In this episode, I'm visiting Cambodia, a land of abundance. A thousand years ago, the Angkor Empire founded one of the most sophisticated cities in the ancient world and built the world's largest religious monument. They were masters of bringing stone to life. I think if they let go, I'm going to fall. I'm exploring how the Angkor Empire dominated Southeast Asia for 600 years. A male ascetic cutting his own fingers into the fire. As the most powerful civilization of the medieval age. That was really fun. To see what remains of a great people. Just look at the size of them. And how their legacy shapes the nation today. I'm visiting Phnom Kulen. The most sacred mountain in Cambodia. For centuries, this has been an important pilgrimage site for the people here. You can't come to the top of Phnom Kulen without getting a blessing. I feel sanctified. <laughs> this mountain is such a spiritual place because legend has it, it was where the great Angkor Empire was born 1,200 years ago. Wow! Look at this amazing view. There aren't many written records left from the earliest period of Khmer history. But a stone inscription discovered in the late 19th century tells of a Khmer prince who spent many years in a foreign land described as Java. 
The story goes, Jayavarman II was the son of a nobleman who lived abroad for most of his life. But in 790, at the age of 20, he returned to unite the Khmer for the first time. He travelled the land making alliances with competing factions. In 802, he came to the Kulen Hills for a special ritual to proclaim himself the Chakravatin, or ruler of the universe. And this was the universe he ruled. A 1,000 square kilometer plain on the edge of Southeast Asia's largest lake. This is a land of extreme weather cycles. In the monsoon season, between May and November, water levels can rise over 10 meters. But for the rest of the year, drought takes hold, and temperatures can soar to 40 degrees Celsius. Because of this, water became the focus of the ancient Khmer. These symbols carved into the rocky riverbed are called lingas and are sacred fertility symbols associated with the Hindu god Shiva. And there are so many of them here the reason why this river is called the River of a Thousand Lingas. The thinking behind the carvings was that as the water flowed over them, it became sanctified. It later merged downstream with the Siem Reap River into the paddy fields of Angkor. They were almost like the spiritual water purifiers for the entire region, and they remain so today. But sacred waters aren't enough to make an empire. To succeed, Angkor needed a stable supply of food. And the solution was an amazing strain of rice. To find out more, I'm helping in a paddy field with some good old-fashioned weeding. Here, I'm here in Wind's rice field to pull out these long grasses called salaptia, which means duck wing grass. Salaptia ni vi mien krup chran, vi tuk doi krup chran, jeng trau da vi chan ba jeng mun da te pe jeng bom mol pal mo krup vi pan ta pui to tiet. And I love these very simple occupations. It really clears my mind. So I'm going to be busy, happily busy. Every year, the monsoon flood brings fresh nutrients to the soil, making it extremely fertile. But with the annual deluge of the monsoon, growing rice here is a challenge. So that's so amazing. So this is an ancient grain that can respond to the changing water levels. Known as floating rice, these plants can grow as much as 10 centimetres a day to a height of about 6 metres, fast enough to stay above flood waters. The grain was key to the early success of the Angkor Empire, allowing the fledgling kingdom to secure enough food for its people. But to truly succeed, the ancient Khmer needed not just to adapt to changes in the water level, but to control it. This is the West Mebon Temple. What I can see here is this incredibly beautiful pond with steps going down. 
and a dramatic walkway that would have risen above the water to a central shrine in the middle. It must have been all arranged to ensure that water is always present here. The ancient Khmer believed all life came from the sea of creation. And surrounding the temple is an enormous reservoir that represents this mythical ocean. Built in the 11th century, the West Barai is over two kilometers wide and eight kilometers long, making it the biggest hand-cut reservoir in the world. A thousand years on, it still holds close to 50 billion liters of water, which is used to irrigate the area's crops. It's a remnant of the ancient Khmer's engineering mastery that allowed them to wear their yearly droughts. The West Barai was part of a hugely complex system of canals and reservoirs that fed into the city of Angkor and its rice fields. The result was a quadrupling of the grain harvest, which was transported along canals and rivers to the furthest corners of the empire. The result was food security and a surplus of rice for trade which became the economic foundation of Angkor and propelled the empire into greatness. But to extend their influence further, Angkor needed a more direct means of transport, roads. This is a 1,000-year-old pathway to learn how it was built to survive so many centuries, I'm joining a team of builders led by Sopyap An. I try a salmon, Okay. Peter, I try to get some lay. Okay. Some book. I clung in a date that may perfect dome. This technique is known as soil compacting and was used by the Khmer to build their roads and temple foundations. Okay. So I have to keep pounding until I hear this brighter, more solid sound, right? Good. <laughs> this technique allowed Angkor's roads to withstand the contraction and expansion of the soil during the dry and wet seasons. It's incredible how the simple technique of compacting sand can build a foundation that lasts for millennia. The Khmer relied on basic tools and sensory techniques to build a vast network of roads across the entire region, so different from the technologies we rely on today. By the 11th century, Angkor's kings had built an extensive network of roads, some of which are still used today. I'm travelling on a dirt road on this charming ox cart, which has been used for about a millennia here. The road is as straight as an arrow, just like the great Roman roads in Europe. I can see endless rice fields, water buffaloes, and it must have looked just like this in the Angkor period. This was the superhighway of that time. People travel like this for days. It's quite comfortable now, but to be honest, I don't know how I'd feel after a few days. Six main arteries stretched for over 1,000 kilometers. To the west, to modern Thailand, an important salt-producing region. To the north, to the access point of the Mekong River, where rice and fish were traded with neighboring kingdoms. And east, to the old capital, an important center of learning. 
This network of roads helped to extend Angkor's political power and cultural influence across the region. But to become a true regional powerhouse, the Angkor Empire first needed to overcome the largest annual flood event brought about by Southeast Asia's largest river. I want to know how the ancient Khmer adapted to survive in their environment. Near the ancient capital of Angkor lies Southeast Asia's largest body of fresh water, Tonle Sap Lake. I'm helping Fisherman Tai to check his nets and bring in his catch. The net is really fine, so the fish gets really caught into it, and you have to gently tuck it out because it also has really sharp fins on the side. So what would you consider a good catch? Every year, something amazing happens here. The monsoon floods the country and expands the lake to five times its normal size, flooding over 7,000 square kilometers. Then, in the dry season, the flow of water reverses and the lake empties back into the Mekong. This annual ebb and flow has seen the lake nicknamed the beating heart of Cambodia. I'm travelling along a river running out of the lake to the village of Kampong Kliang, which is built 15 metres off the ground. In the wet season, the lake would rise, taking the water to just below the level of these homes. Just look at these. It's like a surreal fortress. I've never seen anything like it. I want to see how its residents survive in such an extreme environment. Oh my goodness. Look at this view. Kim Hyang's family makes a living from shrimp. So what is it like to live here? So your happiness is dependent on the water? Yeah. To build settlements and survive on such a lake show the resilience and ingenuity of the Khmer people. It's so inspiring to see how people in this village have adapted to their environment by building houses so high up. It can be dry one season and then the next, completely submerged in so much water. It's unimaginable. As the ancient Khmer thrived, they built a complex society. To find out how, I'm at a site built by Angkor's greatest king, Jayavarman VII.
At its height, the temple of Priya Khan was the epicenter of ancient society. It was a place of learning, but also linked to administration. An inscription found here states that almost 100,000 public servants donated goods and services to the temple to ensure the smooth running of the empire. Polly is an archaeological architect who is overseeing the restoration of the temple. Garudas are mythical bird-like creatures, popular in Hindu and Buddhist cosmology. 72 of these winged guardians protect these sacred grounds. Jayavarman VII, who built this temple, came into power over a divided empire and used it as a center of administration to reunite his people and restore order across his lands. Polly lets me have a go at carving my own piece of Angkor history. Can I try? Yeah. 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 I hope I don't break something. Like this? Yeah. You actually get quite good control. Um, yeah, this is the perfect tool. It's so peaceful here, it's hard to imagine that 800 years ago, it was a hive of activity. Scholars visiting from all over the region, local farmers paying their taxes, and officials making crucial decisions about matters of state. It's like a temple, university, and government ministry all rolled into one. The ancient Khmer relied on its temples as gateways to manage its almost one million strong populace under which the empire thrived. And the result was the building of one of the most iconic structures of all time. I'm exploring the rise of the Angkor Empire. And at last, my journey brings me here. The largest religious monument in the world, Angkor Wat. Built almost 900 years ago, the temple's design mimics the Hindu universe. With the five towers representing the peaks of Mount Meru, home of the Hindu gods, under which it said, King Surya Varman II was laid to rest in 1150. I've been here so many times, but it just never ceases to move me in this very deep way. Surrounding the temple is an enormous moat that symbolizes the Hindu sea of creation. But it also holds a secret that helped the structure withstand the cycle of flood and drought. To learn more, I'm speaking to archaeologist Socrates Um, who has studied this feat of architecture for 20 years. This moat is so beautiful and it is so huge. Mm. Can you tell me more about it? Yeah, yes, uh, you are right. Beautiful in, in, in you know, landscape, but also they yeah, are practical. The moat has the mean to decrease the pressure pushed out from the heavy structure Without this mode, Uncle Wat will collapse. I find that so incredible. It just looks like this very beautiful lake, and you'd never imagine that it had this really important function. 
But it wasn't just masterful engineering that made this megastructure possible. We have enough population, enough economy, enough resource, and human capacity. So all these things combine at the yeah. right time yeah. to yeah. create this incredible monument. Yes. Angkor Wat is an engineering masterpiece. It looks a part of a sacred Hindu temple, but there are also all these things going on which have helped realize this enormous structure. I would never have imagined that to build something so high, you needed to worry about the underground water table. But they were so good at managing and storing water that they found this very elegant design solution that also ticked the box of religious symbolism. It's pure genius. But that just scratches the surface of this incredible structure. Inside the compound is further evidence of the ancient Khmer's artistic skill. Decorative stonework and vivid carvings that bring the past to life. including the mighty king, Suryavarman II, in whose honour the temple was built. He's seated on this grand throne with all these symbols of his kingship. Just look at him. This is really a very wealthy and powerful king. Further down the corridor is another iconic scene that tells us something about the Angkor Empire of the day. Here is the Khmer army and their allies, heading into battle with their longtime enemy to the east, the Dai Viet. It depicts all these kings on elephants from the satellite states surrounding Angkor. It emphasizes Suryavarman II's power, that he was able to muster all these forces from the states around him towards this attack against the Dai Viet. These carvings are a testament to Angkor's might. But the majority of the carvings here aren't about the empire at all. Instead, they tell stories of Hindu cosmology that shed a light on the inner beliefs of its people. Now, this is simply spectacular. Possibly the most iconic bas relief in Angkor Wat. This is a massive 49-metre heavenly tug of war between good and evil. Above, look at all these apsaras or celestial dancers springing out from the ocean. There are more than 2,000 apsaras carved into the walls of Angkor Wat. Images that have found new meaning in modern Cambodia. This Apsara dance is a modern adaptation, inspired by the imagery found at Cambodia's most famous temple. This is really stunning. It's as though the carvings have come to life. The joy is in observing the slightest movements, which speak volumes. While the original dance is said to have begun in the 7th century, the closest we can come to it today is through these modern reimaginings. It's one of the most popular dances in Cambodia. I'm going to learn what all the movements mean. This means sigh. This is a sigh. Yes, sigh. I'm sighing in pain. Oh, ow! This is crying. Yes, cry. The finger bent over. 
I feel like a clumsy old bear among the Apsaras. Go. Oh, this is flying. Yes, flying. Oh. Flying. I think if they let go, I'm going to fall. And after the angel's flight, it's time to come down. So this is arriving, the final pose. We've landed back to Earth. That was amazing. Thank you. What I've learned is that it's very difficult. Thank you so much. Thank you. What's so interesting is how important this was for modern Cambodians to create a national identity based on Angkor that everyone could rally behind. By the 12th century, Angkor was a prosperous city with a thriving culture. And it was the rise of a new king with new ideas that pushed the empire to unprecedented heights. But he also set the stage for its ultimate downfall. I'm exploring the last chapter of the great Angkor Empire. In 1181, a new king took power called Jayavarman VII. He ordered more building projects than all of his predecessors combined, extending the road network further than ever before and expanding the empire's territory as far as modern-day Myanmar, Vietnam and the Malay Peninsula. Angkor was the uncontested superpower of Southeast Asia. I'm at the Bayon Temple, built by King Jayavarman VII. Just look at the size of them. It's famed for its over 200 stone faces, said to be the king's own likeness, frozen in eternity as the image of the Buddha. Julia Estev, an expert of ancient Khmer religion, has a theory about the change of faith, away from Hinduism, which has to do with the mystical sect. Tantric Buddhism is a secret path that is uh, very uh, strongly populated with secrecy, magic, forbidden behavior to become enlightened while alive. So here, for example, we can see uh, a male ascetic cutting his own fingers with a knife yes, I here can see that. into the fire. This could be, yes, a very good illustration of these taboo behaviors that Tantric Buddhism is practicing. These forbidden rituals were designed to reaffirm King Jayavarman VII's connection to the divine. It attracts fear and also respect, and it gives extreme magical powers. So he was playing with fire, but it helped him achieve this aura which no other king could manage before. Yes. Jayavarman VII built this magnificent temple with these faces, one of the most recognizable images of the Angkor Empire, in order to enhance his claim to power. The king put himself as a god of a new kind of state religion, full of rituals, mantras and magic, it was a very clever tactical move, and it worked.
Thanks to his political move to embrace Tantric Buddhism, Jayavarman VII enjoyed a golden reign. But the move away from Hinduism had repercussions a hundred years later. Hindu hardliners rebelled in the late 13th century, destroying the Buddhist temples of state and dividing the empire from within. It was then that a powerful enemy from the West made their move. In 1431, Angkor was attacked by a new force, the kingdom of Ayutthaya. After a seven-month siege, Ayutthaya's army ransacked the city, taking close to 100,000 prisoners and several tons of gold. So came the sudden end of the great Angkor Empire. But new research is showing that this was the final blow in a long decline. Many of the records throughout Archaeologist Miriam Stark is looking back in time for clues about life here in the 13th century, the closing years of the Angkor Empire. So you take a trowel, okay. and you can scrape around the back here and around the front mm -hmm. very gently and see if you can expose this. Try yeah. not to break the shard, <laughs> That's right. I promise. Doing a good job there. <laughs> so we think these are residential areas. We're finding all kinds of artifacts and materials that suggest household activity, cooking, eating. We have animal bones. I see, so this is sort of domestic trash. We like to say domestic debris. It sounds a little oh, more sorry. polite. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, now why don't you stop for a minute and just gently, with your hand, wiggle it. And then you can look at it. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. It's just amazing to pull out something just from a shallow pit like this, which is so ancient. Next, the shard is washed, and it's beginning to show itself for the first time in 800 years. Beautiful. Yeah, that looks fantastic. So it has these wonderful mottled colours. You see green, you see browns. It's almost abstract. Yeah, we call this a brown glaze, brown so glaze. it's really high fired. We don't often find such large pieces like this. It's really special. Archaeologist Alison Carter is piecing together these shards to build a picture of what was going on in the Angkor Empire. We start seeing a decline in the number of ceramics that we find and that tells us that there are probably fewer people living in that area. But this population decline didn't just come at the end of the empire in the 15th century, but much earlier than previously thought. The decline of Angkor actually seems to be taking maybe a couple centuries, and there's a lot of different factors that are part of that. Religious change and sociopolitical change and even climatic change. So this is revealing that people were leaving Angkor way before the official end of the empire. Right, exactly. As ocean-going technology improved, maritime trade between China and India increased, pooling economic activity and people away from Angkor. With less people and money, the city's elaborate system of reservoirs and canals filled up with silt and became ineffective, leaving Angkor devastated by two mega droughts, each of which lasted decades. Unable to recover, Angkor was left to ruin, reclaimed by the jungle. But after its rediscovery in 1860, the city of Angkor has been given a new lease of life as the heart of Cambodian identity. It's Southeast Asia's biggest tourist draw, visited by over two million people each year. This is putting a strain on the city's resources 
and bringing a whole new problem, litter. But its residents are coming together to conserve their symbol of national pride. I'm joining Sopia, a local hotel worker who is volunteering to clean up the modern city of Siem Reap. Straw. A lot of straws. Plastic spoons. Oh my god, a battery. It's quite fun to be out here and I love cleaning up, so this is really my kind of activity. What do you think about clean up projects like this? I think we must do it every day and every week. Right now, it's time to change. Mm -hmm. We stop using plastic, but we're trying to clean more and more to keep our environment clean and green. So we've been picking trash down the stretch of road. And this is just my hall. It is so heavy. Clearly, people who live and work around here want to see a much cleaner Siam Reap. While the volunteers are busy cleaning up the ancient city, I'm getting a taste of a vibrant living tradition. Once a necessity of life in Angkor, this Khmer pastime is kept alive through a much-loved national celebration. The annual Dragon Boat Race. It takes place every November at the end of the rainy season. This team of local farmers is busy training for the race. Their captain, Mom Mek, is giving me tips on how to paddle like a real Angkor man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, follow instructions, keep the momentum, and don't fall off. <laughs> Ready? This unique paddling style was a technique used in battle by the ancient Khmer army giving rowers more power. I love how this competition brings everybody in the village together. It's such a community effort. It's so wonderful to learn that such a vibrant festival has its roots in a battle that took place almost 800 years ago during the Angkor Empire. And the fact that Cambodia's biggest festival is based around the annual water cycles shows how much it's still in the heart of the nation's psyche. I've seen how, for eons, life in Cambodia has been defined by water. And the ability to store and control it enabled the empire to grow and flourish to unprecedented heights. The Angkor Empire found itself in challenging conditions. On the edge of floodplains, where water levels could rise as much as 10 meters high. But these harsh conditions also primed their skills to survive and build dazzling structures which remain to this day. While Angkor has become a world icon of Southeast Asian history, to the Cambodian people, it remains a beacon of their past glory on which they build their modern identity and nation. <laughs>